All right. I'll start proceedings just as numbers start coming, continue to come up. Um, so welcome, everyone. So great to see so many of you joining us for this second webinar. My name is Rola Jawi. I'm a professor of education research at Cradle. Um, my job today really is to keep the proceedings running. I'm the MC and um, mainly, maybe, maybe asking some tricky questions as well of our panelists. Um, so it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, all right, so welcome everyone. Um, like I said, so this is this is the second webinar in this series looking at how educators should respond to the challenge of chat, chat GPT, implications of generative artificial intelligence for higher education um, webinar two. And I should say that this is in collaboration between Cradle and TechSelf. So I wish to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional custodians of the land on which I am located. On behalf of us all, I pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island traditional custodians, elders and ancestors of all the lands from which you may be joining our gathering today. I express our gratitude for their care of country, which continues to sustain us as it has done for millennia. Education has a long and rich heritage on this continent, which we aim to honour and reflect in the ways we teach and learn. Please use the chat if you want to enter the lands on which you are um, currently on. Um, these are really the three modes of engagement we'll be using today. The chat is going to be moving fast. If you were at the last session, it was really moving really, really quickly. So I won't be monitoring the chat. It's really for you participants to share ideas. And in the last webinar, we also shared links and we're happy to download those and share them with you. Um, I will reiterate at this point that this, um, this is being recorded and we will share all slides and recordings with you. So just to let you know, um, I can see that people are still coming in and, and we, I'll repeat that message in the chat shortly again. Um, in terms of Twitter, we do have a hashtag, ChatGPT Higher Ed at Cradle Deacon and at Texa if you want to bring us into the conversation. Um, hopefully our colleague Joanna Tai will be doing some amazing tweeting of the messages that are coming out of today, but please do contribute as well. Um, these form an, an excellent archive of what is happening now as we deal with these disruptions and maybe even might become fodder for research into the future. The final way really is the main way that we'll be taking on your input, and that's through the Q&A function. So please use that for formal asking of questions. That's where I'll take the questions and put them to the panel. Um, you can upvote questions as well. So that means that I will have it uh, looking at the ones that are voted up higher the most and asking those questions initially. Like with all our webinars, this will run for an hour and a half. Um, we will end formal proceedings at an hour. So if you need to leave at 3 p.m., that's absolutely fine. But for those who wish to ask questions and, and remain, we will run till 3.30. Um, so, yeah. And what we've got, we've got four panellists. They will each speak for about eight minutes or so, then the other panel members will ask each other questions. Uh, and then after that, I will open, and open it up for general Q&A. Please use the chat to talk amongst each other and the Q&A for questions. So like I mentioned, this is webinar two. And um, if you missed webinar one, the recordings are available and we can. I will share those in the chat with you. Um, once I've done my bit and the next person is up. And this webinar is also being recorded. So the first one really looked at ChatGPT from a regulatory perspective, but also a higher level kind of leadership perspective. What do we know about it? What is happening in institutions at the moment as we try and catch up with ourselves um, with what's going on? Uh, it, 
my, you know, it was we had 1,700 people actually on the webinar at the one time and 3,000 people registered, above 3,000 people registered. The chat was really, the, the conversation from the panellists was really interesting. And just to orient you a little bit, like my take home is that we're all really learning together to work with ChatGPT. Um, we are developing our resources and our strategies and our policies and practices as this kind of takes hold and um, based on existing work but also some new things that are being disrupted. Um, so one of the things that was raised was around, you know, how does it contribute to academic integrity? And Texas line was that if it if you've used AI, then you need to actually acknowledge its use. We touched on issues of ethics and issues of legality. Um, and I think for me, one really important message was around we can't ignore it. We need to help our students build a relationship with AI, but it needs to be ethical and it needs to be thought through carefully in ways that support and scaffold learning. But I'm sure today's panellists will be able to really provide greater depth around these issues. And that's what webinar two is about. How should educators respond to chat GPT? Now the webinar after this, which is number three, and there will be a fourth, but number three is currently towards the end of May, looking like it will be towards the end of May. And the rationale for that is because we will look back as trimester one has happened or semester one, if you run semesters at your university and try and gather the things we've learned from this first trimester. Um, in relation to how we work with AI in both assessment and maybe even teaching and learning. So that's the structure of the webinar for today and how it fits in overall with the bigger series. Now, if you're really unfamiliar completely with ChatGPT, I'm going to do a really brief introduction, uh, noting that I'm not a techie person. So that's, you know, <laughs> my perspective is from the education perspective and from basically Googling it and asking Google, what is ChatGPT? Um, it's a natural language processing tool driven by AI, artificial intelligence. The way it works is that it writes really well through predicting patterns of language drawn from large collection of textual matter. So, and if anyone wants to correct me, please go ahead. But my understanding is it looks at probabilities of text that follows through and constructs its language that way. It can write really well. Um, uh, you know, I've seen people say that they've tested their assessment in chat GPT and the product is a pass, if not above. Um, it can also produce nonsense. So, you know, it depends on um, how critical you are, how good the prompts are is my understanding and how rich the literature is, or, or not the literature, the, the, the database bank is that it's drawing from. It cannot reason, but it's capable of complex and coherent expression that stimulates sophisticated thinking. So what can it do? It can answer questions, it, it can compose essays, it can have conversations, it can create rubrics. I saw someone who was on the webinar last, I think, said that they created a whole syllabus for their unit of study using ChatGPT. Um, and it can create code very, very quickly. This is an example that Margaret gave me around how um, it asked ChatGPT to critique this sentence, the cat wears pink pyjamas. You have to take it up with Margaret, what she was thinking at the time. Um, and this was its response. So from a grammatical standpoint, the sentence, et cetera, is correct. And it goes on to clarify some reasoning around why that might be. Um, so, you know, you can see that the sentence structure is, 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 is good. Now, I mean, one thing that it also states it's while it's not impossible, it's not a color that is typically associated with cats or their clothing. So I actually did Google whether there are cats with pajamas, pink pajamas on um, the internet, and there are images if you are interested. 
just everything is on there. But what is interesting about it is that then you can give it different prompts. So you can ask it to write in a different lyrical style or a literary style and it will do that. It will modify the text that it gives you to suit a particular genre of writing and that's, I think, where some of the cleverness comes in. So that's enough from me. Basically, now I'm going to hand over to the panel. This is the running order in which we're going to be going. I'm going to start with Professor Margaret Behrman, um, move on to Dr Lucinda McKnight, Professor Simon Buckingham Shumman, Associate Professor Sarah Howard. So I'm going to stop sharing and introduce Margaret just as she gets ready to get going. Um, so Margaret Beerman is a research professor in the Centre for Research and Assessment and Digital Learning here at Cradle. She is a colleague and a dear friend of mine. Um, her research really focuses on higher education and professional contexts with expertise in assessment design, feedback and education in a digital world. Um, she is the digital person um, for Cradle that I go to whenever I'm like, where is, what does this mean? Um, Margaret, do you want to take the stage? And I started talking before I'd unmuted myself and put on my camera. <laughs> so what a fabulous technology person I am. Um, thanks so much, Rola. Um, just um, going to share some slides with you now. And I am... Um, Get to speak about um, uh, assessment design. So I'm just um, organising myself here. Hopefully that's all good for you. Um, and um, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to their elders, uh, past, present and future, as I stand on Wurundjeri country. Assessment design for a world with Gen AI, um, a big topic, uh, and I've got eight minutes, so I'll, I'll just cover off on a few things. I'd like to acknowledge that this work is really drawn from my colleagues in Cradle, including the wonderful Roller and um, the other folk here and stuff we've worked on over a few years now. And I'd also like to note that the slides with references and the video will be distributed to all registrants, just, just FYI, because we've always had a few questions about that. Um, so um, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm hoping that ChatGPT is going to act as a catalyst for change in our assessment to make it better. And I've got a question mark there because in previous work, we've noted that the digital actually is locked in, or we think the digital is locked in, an old set of ideas about assessment. And the, the impression I have is there's a gap between our assessments and the digital world in which we live and work, and that I think this is an opportunity to bring these worlds a little bit closer together. My first suggestion is a really simple one, and that's to include students. So who knows how students will use it? Gen, Gen AI, we're speculating wildly, but the one people who do know how students are using Gen AI are students. So I do think we should talk to them. And I think we should promote diverse student input into our assessment design. I was on a project about um, making exams more inclusive and we spoke with and worked with students and I thought it was so important in the step towards ensuring that assessments are more equitable. And I, the last thing I think we really want is for Gen AI to become another barrier between people who can afford to use it, who have access to it, and those who, have, who do not. This is my, I mean, first and possibly most important um, point. And then I want to talk more generally about this idea of designing Gen AI into assessment. We I mean, think about designing the digital into assessment in three ways. A lot of the time we think about Gen AI and EdTech generally, or technologies generally as a tool, you know, and this is the sort of thing where you might, you know, use Gen AI, presumably legally and ethically, to develop say, um, a rubric, or if we're a student, we might use Gen AI to help us do some writing, and um, that's kind of an exciting opportunity. But I think the other thing from an assessment task, 
from an assessment perspective is not just how the students are doing the tasks, but what we are assessing and what the assessment is doing. So I think we also need to think about assessing digital literacies. And I think that Simon may have more to say on this front, um, is my guess. Um, and so, for example, if we're going to say that prompt, prompting students, prompt, prompt engineering, that writing the Gen AI prompt, the chat GPT prompt is an important thing for students to do, we need to assess it. And um, we need to also ask students to critique uh, the whole idea of prompting in that in that question. What happens to our prompt? What happens when, what is the sort of link between Gen AI, um, data, our information, privacy, ethics? These are things that I think we need to be assessing. And finally, the last point, which is what I'm going to spend a little bit more time on, is this idea of human capabilities. And this is the idea that we should be assessing for capabilities that are uniquely human, i.e. things that Gen AI can't do. And this really is this sort of idea of education in this age should be about human capabilities. And Joseph Aoun, like six years ago, and Rose Luckin, five years ago, had quite um, had wrote books very much on this point. And from an assessment perspective, this boils down to something very simply. If a machine can do it, how much do we need to assess it? Is are these the capabilities that our students will be needing in a world of artificial intelligence? So from this perspective, I, I want to present one of these ideas. And this is um, this notion that machines do not construct quality. AI does not construct quality. Um, Gen AI is trained by humans and trains itself according to social standards of quality. We say what good writing looks like and Gen AI um, works according to those socially set boundaries. In other words, Gen AI doesn't say what counts for good work. And I would argue that we in higher education are particularly concerned with the business of saying what good work is, what quality is in our disciplines, and that quality is a complex, contextual and discipline-specific notion. And, and we want to teach our students it. And this is where the notion of evaluative judgment comes in and developing evaluative judgment through assessment becomes important. So evaluative judgment, capability to make decisions about quality of work of self and others. For example, our students need to learn to know what makes elegant software code or an original persuasive philosophical, philosophical argument or anything you can think of it in your discipline, the sorts of qualities that make work good. So assessment should develop students' evaluative judgment as a means to prepare for an AI world because this notion of quality is something that AI really doesn't do and chat GPT as a bonus, doesn't appear very good at simulating complex contextual and disciplinary evaluative judgments. So not only are we doing something developmentally good, but we also uh, have the ability to develop assessments that, um, that target something that chat can't, GPT can't do very well. So kind of really to the, the educator prompt. So how can I adapt my assessments now? Well, the first thing I'd really suggest to have a look at is critically review how you use your rubrics. Limit how rubrics reward knowledge recall or common generic approaches. Rubrics represent the teacher's conceptualization of quality. They're, that's how we present that to our students. We say this is what a quality lab report looks like, a quality essay is, a quality whatever it is, a quality um, oral presentation. It's through rubrics and other forms of assessment criteria. So how do they invite liberal opportunities for students to contribute their own thinking and doing to the development of quality work? The next thing is to design assessment tasks so students must make and defend complex contextualised judgments and own and others' work. And we, in this chat GPT conversation and the concerns about academic integrity, we kind of forget that assessment also includes formative, non-graded assessments. These are really important. We can start to layer in um, progression from one assessment to another that becomes um, 
both developmental and more um, challenging for something like ChatGPT to do? What are opportunities are there for students to assess exemplars and self appear uh, to assess each other? How do how do these build on each other? And finally, I'd suggest we need to assess evaluative judgments. So we need to ask students and um, make some judgments about how they've changed their work through making these evaluative judgments. And there's an example in, in one of the chapters we've written. So finally, three points. Include assess students in assessment design. If a machine can do it, how much do we need to assess it? And develop and assess students' grasp of quality of work, their evaluative judgments. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, I'm going to invite questions from the panel. Lucinda, you've got your video on, so I'm going to take it that you have a question. I do. Margaret, I'm sure you have thought of this before, but with the idea of sort of um, evaluating and making judgments, evaluative judgments, which I think is so important, when you do put things into chat GPT, it does give you feedback. How, how do you get around students just using chat GPT to give, give judgment? I mean, it might not be very good judgment, but it might be enough to submit as an assessment task. I think that we're a little bit, and we've had this conversation before, I think we're a little bit, I'm not coming from the angle that we should be um, seeking to, as a primary motivation, to um, catch students out. So I guess to me that's less of a concern. And I, I think I come back to the rubric again. If you put in your rubric, if you say your standards, your markers of quality are complex contextualised judgments, you know, that's what you're seeking, then you start to say that your quality is not the common and generic answers that something like ChatGPT can currently do. But that, to me, is a secondary sort of proposal here. Um, I think there's another set of, I, I think it doesn't do it very well at all. And I think that within the bounds of assessment design, I also trust educators to be able to set the parameters of their assignment to um, to ensure that the design is that is um, complex and contextualized enough to um, to promote the sorts of student activities that they would like, and I think this is what we need to be thinking about. Uh, I think the general principles hold, and I've said this before. You know, cheaters are going to cheat. We can spend a lot of time trying to stop people from cheating, or we can think about how we can encourage the sorts of complexity that we want, and we know that ChatGPT doesn't do very well. Simon, I think you've got a question. Very interesting, Margaret. You've got me thinking about evaluative judgment now. Mm -hmm. So um, now clearly ChatGPT can't engage in evaluative judgment itself because it's, it's not human, it's not in a context, but it can certainly um, give me instant feedback Yes. That I could use to yes. test my own evaluative judgment. Yes. Now, so, you know, a student, uh, you know, I've done this myself. I put some writing in and asked it to critique it. Not just, not just critique this and leave it open ended. I've asked it to critique the writing from a particular conceptual framework. And I've yes. been impressed at what it can do. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I might have thought I've done an awesome job but it might actually reveal some new thoughts to me. Now, would you would you accept that that is ChatGPT scaffolding the formation of evaluative judgment? Absolutely. And I've, I've, I, I think it does. I, I, I've asked, um, ChatGPT, I think, does an excellent line, and I don't mean this meanly. It sounds a bit mean, but isn't it? It does an excellent line in motherhood statement. It's, it's outstanding at motherhood. But those motherhood statements, I think, are really useful. So sometimes, you know, I've run something past it and it's sort of gone, you know, well, have you thought about? And maybe it wasn't 100% correct on what I, what I thought was the issue, but it raised the question. And I do think that it can definitely scaffold a value to judgment. And I think that's um, the sort of way in which we can consider using it as a tool. I do, I do really um, mm. think that. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's, uh, offers a lot of opportunity in that regard. So, Margaret, then other than an, perhaps another source of performance-relevant information, yeah. is this just about good assessment design? I think that it's about, 
Well, that's why the original prompt was to say, I think, hope it's a catalyst for things we should have been doing anyway, I, without question. So yes and no. And the no part is I think there's a shift in balance towards those, what the capabilities that we do that machines can't do are. So I think evaluative judgment comes up that list. And some other things that we might have previously said, like, you know, um, um, well, beautiful writing might have been one, Um, I I think will fall away. And I think we need to look at um, where our priorities lie in assessment differently. Great. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I mean, Oh, there is there is I, one question actually that you know I mean just because it can do beautiful writing does that mean we shouldn't also support our students to learn beautiful how to do beautiful writing? Well, as you know, Rolla, <laughs> I'm a writer, <laughs> and I have views on this. That Lucinda's really the person who should answer this question. Yeah. She's yeah. one short yeah. about writing and, and ChatGPT, but I want to also vote it. So I'll answer this from a quality standards perspective. There is a particular standard of writing in ChatGPT and it takes genre and takes a few other points, but it has been trained against a particular definition of what looks like good writing and you can see it in its arguments. So um, um, I think we should closely monitor how it unfolds. Um, We write differently now as a consequence of text and word processing. Our writing has changed when we had, since my my father learned to write with with an old fashioned pen, you're not a ballpoint. And he said the the actual writing experience was different. What you write is different. So I think that things will develop with it um, and our very notion of writing standards will change. Great, thank you, Margaret. And that's a perfect segue over to you, Lucinda. Um, I just want to correct an earlier mistake that I made around timing. I'm I'm told that actually the panel is officially on till 1.30 and we will go on for two hours, um, so half an hour after that for questions. So apologies for everyone, to everyone. Um, So Lucinda, I'm going to hand over to you. Lucinda is an Australian Research Council Fellow undertaking a discovery Early Career Research Award, a DECRA project in digital writing, go Lucinda at Deakin University. She's interested in digital literacies and the educator professional learning required to enhance the uptake of digital technologies. Over to you, Lucinda. Thanks, Rola. Yes, that last question, I was thinking, I want to answer that, but no, I better leave it to Margaret uh, because it's her part of the session. Anyway, so yes. My project is about digital writing and it's about the way writing is changing. So I have been thinking about this in depth for two years. If you look back, if you Google my name and the conversation, you can see more than two years ago, I was writing articles about this, pretty much covering everything everyone's saying in the media today. So I've been thinking a long time and um, chat uh Chat GPT was the game changer that suddenly made everyone else interested in the thing that I had been researching and writing about. Some of what I have um, published, I will put in the chat at the end of this, including detailed descriptions for the the, um, classroom activities that I'm going to be mentioning, or at least some of them. Okay, so first of all, I just wanted to say that yesterday, the, um, so well, someone very important in the International Baccalaureate, uh, which is a, a you know senior qualification available globally at, for school students, came out and said that chat GPT was going to be allowed in student writing and it would just be cited like any other source. So potentially at tertiary level, we're having students coming to us who have officially been using these sorts of things in their work. And from my own perspective, having been researching this for a couple of years, I know that students, school students and tertiary students have been using AI writers for years. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that everyone here, all of the thousands of people enrolled in this session today, have read material students have written by AI, which has been written by AI, or they have read um, articles on the internet. I think we're way behind 
two years ago, even many um, sports reports, business reports and things that you'd read on the web, articles on the web, blog posts on the web were already being written by AI. So what this latest version has done is put a friendly, um, user-friendly chatbot type interface on an engine that was already doing human quality writing. Now, it might have required a bit more input from a bit more tweaking from a human that's more convincing today, but it was still there. It's still, it's still happening. So when I see people saying things like, oh, I think students are starting to blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, students are way ahead with this. So it's now time for us to catch up. And the first thing is I think people need to not put their head in the sand because I saw a lot of head in the sand stuff over the last two years um, when I have been trying to say, hey, we need to talk about this on our academic integrity and progress panels and things like that. And people just were not interested. I think COVID had a lot to do with that. I think people were very preoccupied with COVID. Anyway, so here we go. Now, the IB guy also said that the essay is dead. And looking ahead, we are going to have to move away from this sort of essay form for assessment. So that, that is a very big claim. And I think it, what he was saying was that we humans are going to become people who just tinker with AI text rather than actually writing it. So we need to focus on that instead. But I also want to make the point that ChatGPT is a kind of a distraction because ChatGPT is just one form of AI writing. And I really recommend that people go and have a look at something like WordTune, which gives you the potential like sentence by sentence. It will, it will prompt you as to whether you want to make the sentence longer, make the sentence shorter. Do you want to change the tone in any way? Do you want to make it more casual or do you want to make it more formal? Um, and and then also, if you can afford for something the, something beyond the basic um, edition, you can get you can just hit on it to hit on a particular button to explain a sentence in more detail, to emphasize something, to expand on something, to give an example for something, or to provide a counter argument, to define something, to give an analogy, to find an inspirational quote, um, to put in a joke, or you know all of these different sorts of things. So. It's not just that chat GPT is going to come and write a whole essay that you're going to put in for yourself. It's that chat GPT and other AI writers and writing coaches, you know, this is going to be built into Microsoft Word and other word processors before, before we can, you know, click our fingers. It's, it's going to be intimately interwoven into our writing such that there's no distinguishing between what's human and what's not or any kind of trying to authenticate where ideas came from. I mean, I think that's already come out in the discussions that we've had already um, this morning, you know, in terms of it, 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 it can prompt evaluative judgment. Well, how, if it puts ideas in your head, how, how do you really acknowledge those? So I think myself, in relation to the beautiful writing question, that that's a very dystopian vision that humans will just end up tinkering with AI. And there have been some really great stories in the media about people who do become assistants to chatbots. It's not that the chatbot is your assistant. Um, you, you're helping it. You're just editing its stuff and making sure it, it comes across as seeming realistic. So, you know, I, I don't think that's going to be the case. And if anyone here has worked in publishing or worked with editors or is an editor, you will know that people who edit text need to be absolutely skilled in writing. They have to be better probably than the average writer to, to you know, be able to work as editors. So we are still, or I believe, we are still going to need to write. Um, but what are we going to do in assessment? What what can we do in assessment that, that can get around this, this um, sort of issue? So in, in my articles and publications and thinking about this and conceptualising this, I've talked about needing to think about hybridity and that, that notion of the hybrid writing and reflect on that hybridity and how writing is changing. So thinking about studying these platforms, these writing platforms as text in their own right and looking at their language and structure, their use, their ideology, their political economies, their, 
their governance, their use of data, all of those things and folding that in, as someone has said somewhere, I think in a question or the chat, as a form of data, um, you know, transdisciplinary data literacy that everybody needs to be on top of. There's thinking about agency, about the, the records that we keep, about our interactions with the, this software, the prompts that we use, screen grabs of what we're doing, a whole much greater focus on process rather than product, writing as product, and the whole idea of thought, for writing as thinking, not writing as proof of something. Um, at, at the end or an end product. Thinking about rhetoric, using speculative fiction to imagine where the future's going in our own disciplines with these things, thinking about creativity and designing. For example, a great activity I know teachers are doing in one class, I know, is designing different chatbots. So they're not actually using technology for this. They're just designing these chatbots with different features and then trialling them with people and working out who wants to work with what, which chatbot and why, what kind of biases are inherent in the design process and the choice process, that sort of thing, that cre creative and critical thinking around these things. Um, different versions, you know, using different kinds of AI writers to come up with different versions of things and then comparing across the different, oh, that's my time up, comparing across the different things um, and, and doing that with, with various, in various disciplines. So, yeah, that's just a few ideas for ways that, you know, we can expand assessment, use more diverse assessment, use universal design for learning to have oral, dramatic, videoed, experiential, really recent and, um, and situated, material, embodied, social, exegetical and personal kinds of learning and assessment that are, as, as um, Margaret has, and Rolla have said too, that are really about good assessment design. So I hope there's a few things you can think about there and I'm now going to put some um, background reading in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Lucinda. Um, and I'm really, you know, I really interested in that notion of comparison that you mentioned, you know, because that is about developing evaluative judgment. If you can look at two pieces and work and go, well, what is the difference here in terms of quality, in terms of what that means for then my own work moving forward? What can I take from, from that? Um, it sounds like the the DECRA is very topical and, um, yeah, on point. Can I open it up to the panel? I can see we've lost Sarah, but we are trying to get her back. Um, Simon or Margaret, do you have any questions? Simon. Yeah, that was so interesting, Lucinda. I, I need to read more of what you've been doing. That's 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 very clear to me now. So that's a, that's a good take home for me. Um, I'm, am I sensing an interesting tension here? between the view that we really shouldn't be asking students to do things that AI can do versus a view that we really should be asking students to do things that AI can do because that helps them think. I, I think students are going to need both. And the question is, where do we get the time? Where do we get the time to do this? I mean, I think students have to learn the human the human skills, like I was saying about writing. They have to be able to write before they can edit. It's ridiculous to say someone can um, sort of edit AI text and make those sophisticated evaluative judgments about it. If they can't write themselves, it simply does not follow on. So we have to do both. We, we know, um, you know, that the use of these things is, is built into industry. And from talking to people, I think lots of people in academia need to really very quickly get up to speed with what's happening in their industry. I was talking to someone the other day who is a, a doctor, and a specialist in dermatology, and had suddenly realised that people uh, can use their phones to assess a rash on their skins and identify what it is and proven to be much more effective than a human doctor and is suddenly have to, having to, this is a person in academia, come up to, you know, uh, scratch with what's happening out there. So we know it's it's happening. We're preparing students for the future. We have to teach them to use these these things, but also they have to be experts themselves to use them well. Mm, very interesting. I'm going to come back on that in my little piece in a moment. And not only that, but teachers also have to be expert in doing all of that design work and and actually scaffolding that kind of the task design but also the development of evaluative judgment and I, yeah so that's coming back to my my sort of three questions and takeaways two of them were about time what how do we get the time how how do we get the time how can that be um you know paid for as well the time that 
educators, whether in schools or universities, need to to use all these different tools to play with them, to redesign curriculum, redesign assessment. It is huge. I find myself in violent agreement with just about everything everyone's saying. So that that that's great. I agree with you entirely, Lucinda. I think I think, and there's a difference between what we teach and what we assess at the moment. We teach a lot of things, but we tend to assess a lot of knowledge recall. I'm not saying that we shouldn't assess knowledge recall. I'm just saying that the, the relative priority of it sort of is diminishing in this new world. So I think I, I'm in absolutely violent agreement with you, Anne Simon. I wanted to ask you a question about creativity. How do you see creativity looking like? Um, how have you in your work seen it developing, shift, and what do you think we can expect regarding this? Um, sort of already very difficult to assess facet of um, what we do. That's a great question. Thanks, Margaret. So I, from what I have seen, and I've been looking specifically at writing and I've been looking at what's happening in industry with writing, how novelists and poets and people are using this stuff, it's absolutely thrilling. Like there's a guy who carves poetry with his cursor through through the bodies of rolling AI script. There's there's people doing amazing things out there. And um, so I think where people are going to go on being creative with this stuff, there's no doubt about that. And we also don't want to romanticise humanist creativity, pretending that it comes from zero. Like look at, look at all the, um, you know, music and all the sampling and all that, you know, the stuff like that. And if you're, you're into Bactinian theory, you'll be au fait with the idea of every word being soused or, you know, infiltrated with the millions of times that word's been used before. So creativity, even human creativity comes from elsewhere. And, um, you know, artists are always looking at each other's work and getting ideas from them. So yeah, I think I think we will still be creative. That will still happen, but we'll have different ways of generating creativity. Sorry, I keep looking. I keep looking down like that because I'm looking at the chat because there's so much fantastic stuff going on in there, <laughs> and I wish I could talk about all those comments and questions too. Oh, I, I it's, I'm, yeah, it's um, cognitively overloading the different channels that I'm trying to keep on on top of. Um, Thank you so much, Lucinda. Feel free to go in and, and get into the chat if you like, but we will have an open Q&A after as well. So thank you so much, Lucinda. Sarah, I'm so happy to see you back. And at this point, I'm going to invite Simon to take the stage. Simon is Professor of Learning Informatics at the University of Technology in Sydney, where he serves as Director of the Connected Intelligence Centre. That's a great name, Simon, for the for the centre, working in close partnership with the faculties using human-centred design methods. His team pilots, evaluates and scales data-driven web apps to provide personalised feedback used by more than 35,000 UTS students. Over to you, Simon. Thanks very much, uh, Rola. Uh, what an interesting panel to be on. Uh, I'm going to talk to you, make a little contribution to this conversation by talking about effective ethical engagement with ChatGPT uh, and um, call for us to move from aspiration to evidence. Uh, I come from human-centered computing. Uh, so uh, that's originally where I come from, psychology, ergonomics, human-computer interaction. And then I bring that perspective of the human experience of technology to thinking about learning technology. Um, at UTS, I, and of course, with many other colleagues uh, uh, here, have distilled the key values that we want to promote um, at UTS into this simple diagram, effective ethical engagement. Um, in eight minutes, I can't really dive into the ethics, but we might, well, we might well want to return to that in our conversation. I'm just going to flag that, of course, that includes academic integrity, but we also need to adopt a critical infrastructure perspective to this. We need to be asking hard questions about how all that material got into ChatGPT or DALI or Midjourney, et cetera, harvesting the work of many people without any kind of payment. We need to be asking hard questions about the invisible human labor that means we don't have to deal with regurgitated toxic material that's being processed by ChatGPT someone somewhere is teaching it what bad stuff looks like and that's traumatic work which isn't being properly managed the question that i want to unpack today is 
just about the effective side of things. Okay, what does it mean to engage effectively with this as academics and, and as students? Um, the first point I want to make is that AI has been in education. It's been a research field or community. It has its own journals and conferences, you know, for over 40 years. So it may feel as though we're entering uncharted waters, but there is already extensive research not only in AI and ed, but also in automated writing feedback, which is a sub area of AI and education around conversational user interfaces, which of course is what has made ChatGPT seize the imagination that the creation of a great user experience on top of the underlying language model. Pedagogical agents is not a new thing. People have been studying the role of different kinds of avatars and agents in a learning context for a long time. Translational work needs to be done to help illuminate how we can use these new large language models in effective ways. And we opened that conversation uh, not long ago with a couple of colleagues, Sparky and Shabani, and I opened that conversation. And you can follow that link uh, if you want to replay that. Um, about what, what do we already know from, from, from some of these communities? Um, I'm going to just give you a few glimpses. And I actually want to rewind the clock back to 1991 to a paper which I think is inspirational, um, where Salomon et al. talked about mindful versus mindless engagement with intelligent technologies. That is intelligent tech as it was, you know, in, at, the, at the cusp of the 90s. Um, and they they foreground this, this point that true partnerships between students and students or students and intelligent tech needs agency and effort. And this begs the question as to whether students have the capacity not to be dominated and driven by the technology. And we hear a lot at the moment about humans in the loop. We always want humans in the loop. We don't want to be automating humans out of work. We, we want them in the loop doing all the amazing things that humans do that machines can't. We've already heard some of that this morning. Um, but they've got to be competent, right? If they're not competent humans in the loop, then they're not exercising that kind of agency that they need to be. And students are not professionals. A tool may be an awesome power productivity aid to a trained programmer or, or journalist. That doesn't mean a student who is at the beginning of learning, doesn't know what they don't know, et cetera, et cetera, can make the same use of that tool to learn. So, we need to equip students with the knowledge, curriculum knowledge, for example, the skills, the writing skills, for example, and the dispositions, for example, a sense of what academic integrity is, curiosity, et cetera, to critique these AI contributions. I'm gonna pick out one example of this kind of AI literacy. We're gonna build on the, the feedback literacy work, which is has been one of the, the great contributions of the work at Deakin. Um, but we're, we're now thinking about automated feedback literacy. What does it mean to receive feedback critically and curiously and agentically when it's a machine giving you that feedback, not your, your lecturer or your, your tutor? And this comes from work we've been doing since 2015 on automated writing feedback. So we already know that students don't always engage effectively with automated feedback. It may be there 24-7, but they don't always know how to process it. And we've also shown that explicit scaffolding to promote critical engagement can have significant beneficial effects. So I want to make the point that feedback literacy with chat GPT must be demonstrated. We cannot assume this. And here's just a little snapshot. You can read the paper later if you're curious, but students have been explicitly asked to print out the PDF from Akarita and critique it. What do they agree with? What do they disagree with? And that, when they engage in that meaningfully, um, had, had really good effects. So one implication, and I think that uh, Lucinda may already have hinted at it, is it's, it may become increasingly meaningless to ask students to declare far less evidence how they used every AI suggestion. This has been proposed by some people, right? Because in the future, there may be hundreds of suggestions. They will be co-writing with these tools. So instead, you know, one example, one analogy I have pro I proposed is sessions should be replayable, a bit like a recording studio, with reflection on critical moments. And that we may have analytics that can summarize and visualize student AI interaction. 
And should there be concerns about academic integrity, we will then have process analytics, process diagnostics to assist in answering any concerns. And I've written a bit more about this concept of sort of human AI flow state analytics, if you want to follow that up. But here's an example from my colleague, Antonet Shabani. What we are doing here is visualizing a, a writer using GPT. Okay, if we focus on sentence 15, for example, what this is showing us is that the student accepted a GPT suggestion as it as is. They then edited, adapted a suggestion. They then engaged in some writing of their own, and then they received another suggestion, but they rejected it. Okay, this is process analytics visualized, and we could we could have this summarized as well um, in the future. Going back to this great paper. Another key dilemma I think we're facing right now is what they call systemic or analytical performance. Okay, Are we primarily interested in the performance of the whole human AI system versus what happens when we take the technology away? What's the student's analytical ability? Or is that actually a false dichotomy? We're going to have to deal with both. That seems to be a, a fundamental question as we rethink assessment. So there are many hopes and fears right now, but precious little evidence. We as universities have to fill that vacuum into and provide you know, an evidence base of generative AI pedagogy. We should not be in this position by this time next year. And webinars three and four in this series are going to help us with that. And until that point, um, well, guess what? ChatGPT is prompting an academic who shall remain nameless to hallucinate some plausible references in response to the question, what empirical evidence is there about whether I enhance or impair student learning? Well, this academic has three peer reviewed sources that it can provide. First of all, Fernandez et al 2024 reported that 87% of first year science undergrads were unable to critically appraise chat GPT 4s literature summaries. However, after an hour's coaching in prompt engineering and critical thinking, this dropped significantly to 42%. Moreover, Akamura25 asks if ChatGPT5 levels the playing field for international students, enabling them to focus on their ideas. They enjoy writing more, their grades increase, but they're dependent on ChatGPT. She asks, is this now acceptable? And finally, using writing analytics, Devesi found that students with high self-efficacy adapted 87% of chat GPT suggestions, while those who are medium self-efficacy adapted only 65% and low only 32%. So I offer you these hallucinations as examples of the kind of evidence we really need now. And just to wrap up three things to consider, scaffold that variable student capacity to critique. There will be variation. Think about what that might look like. Guide the students on how to evidence their critical engagement with chat GPT, at least until we get into these sort of flow states where that will actually become impossible in my view and help fill the evidence vacuum. Let's, let's see some quality research and let's, let's, let's debate that. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, I wonder whether that quality research might actually be written by a chat GPT, like you um, have the summaries. Um, one of the themes that are coming through in the chat are around, you know, how much of research papers are being written by chat G by AI already. Well, um, yes, the the role of the role of um, writing bots in research is another parallel discussion that's you know un unfolding at pace in in the research community. Um, there seems to be little doubt that they can be an aid. Um, from a learning perspective, if we think about our PhD students and HDRs, et cetera, master's students, are they going to learn how to do that writing when they are, uh, when when the, um, the, 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 the AI's writing is so apparently impressive? So for example, you know, in my fictional hallucinated reference there, <laughs> the international students are just blown away by how good the writing is. They're not sure how they could improve on it. Right. That's one that's one outcome. The other outcome is that this is a massive springboard that helps them focus on the ideas and they can compete on a more level playing field because they're less worried about expressing themselves fluently in English. 
Um, Simon, I wonder whether that, yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, any thoughts from the panel at the moment? I mean, one thing that struck me as well, if I've still got the floor, Simon, um, and I think this is probably something we have chatted about. One of the things that I argue in my work is that really feedback serves a real relational purpose and affective purpose in, in what we do with students and it helps them to learn the language of the field and the and and, and become professionals in that, that space and feedback plays a really important role. So it's interesting to then see the overlay of your work around the AI generated feedback. But what you're proposing is that it still continues to be scaffolded by the academics in that space who help them to, to, to help them to understand how to make sense of what the information that the AI is providing. Does that does that does the question make sense? Yeah. Well, um I, you, I, I think we're seeing a lot of optimism about students' critical faculties. Okay. And I'm simply putting a question mark on that because we don't know. Well, we, we have a vacuum of evidence right now, I think, about chat GPT because we're just at that point in history, right? But we do know from other work, all the work on automated feedback, computer-supported writing, that, you know, we can't just take that for granted. Mm. Lucinda. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to jump in there to follow on from the discussion about the way it, it can translate things and that it's very appealing to students from, um, you know, who might, might not have English as a first language. It, it also provides fantastic opportunities for bringing translanguaging into the classroom and into assessment. So, you know, working across different languages, being incredibly inclusive. And one the very first school that showed interest in my DECRA project thinking about um, digital writing was a school for students with disabilities who were similarly really excited about the possibility for their students to focus on ideas and, and to write in ways that might have been difficult for them for all sorts of reasons um, beforehand. So there are some really interesting potentials here as well. Yeah. And in that 1991 article, which I love, it is so interesting to read as a text in its time right? Because they're saying we really can't assume that AI is going to be available uh, in the workplace, etc. We have to be able to take the technology away and see whether the student can still perform. We might want to question a, an assumption like that now, uh, um, but um, I'm interested to know what my colleagues think about that. Mm, although uh, so many of us will already have found that you often can't get into chat GPT now, it's too busy, it's not available. So there are, we all know with technology, the realities of using it, are not, not as utopian as it's meant to be. I had another a question though, I wanted to ask about the increase in meaningless labour, Sisyphean kind of labour that could potentially come with with these so-called tools and the, you know the, the checking references is just a classic one in terms of time allowed for marking people are going to need so much more time now to actually look really forensically at reference lists what are your thoughts about this well um one response is that the current problems we have with chat gpt or, or any other tool where it's just hallucinating references i think that's just a that's just a minor detail right now because uh, once they start getting integrated with, um, you know, other knowledge bases and databases, um, then that's just going to go away. That that's an artifact of an. We're looking at an early beta release. It's a concept demonstrator. Uh, it's done an amazing job of convincing the world of the potential. But you know, we're already seeing you know chat integrated with search. So now we can have grounded conversations in real sources rather than just completely imagined ones. And soon that will be integrated with Google Scholar or Microsoft Scholar or, or whatever it will be. So um, I'm, I'm seeing that as a detail that's going to get gradually ironed out. Of course, right now we have to warn students about this. But that, that was just one example. I mean, the other thing is a kind of almost existential increase in the pressure of expectation for writing in industry and in, in study and, and assessment. So if you can produce a blog post in a second, um, high, written in a hybrid form with AI, what perhaps that means that in assessment now you'll have to produce five blog posts instead of one blog post, or do you know what I mean? I just think there's a kind of potential arms race. You know how technology is always meant to cut down on time and, and make efficiencies anyway, just just flagging that for people to think carefully about. 
Margaret and then Sarah, you both. Oh, my, my question was just um, uh, where do you think we should most urgently fund research? What, what would be the first thing you would be funding? Ooh, we used to play this game in my last lab. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think we, we, we do need to know how learners have used generative AI. I know we're focused on chat GPT today, but let's just broaden it out. How did you engage with it? Lucinda's spoken about an emphasis on process, right? Right now, we could ask students to, you know, take a snapshot of your chat GPT session or, you know, download the transcript and append it, right, to your report. But, you know, so now I've got 30 pages of chat GPT transcript appended to every report, and I'm supposed to make sense of that in my massive amounts of time as an educator. Labor, no. labor. <laughs> right there's there's the invisible labor cost right so we need very we need to use ai to help us make sense of how we've used ai we can come back to that if you want sarah yeah thanks simon and that was, that was actually one of my um yeah the kind of in response to the idea of this kind of growing work and how the work kind of proliferates itself and i think that i mean the idea that you know in looking at the kind of humans and computers together, like we still have as humans agency within this, don't we? Like we can control some of this. So do you, what do you see as kind of the steps as university, as lecturers in terms of starting to do this work, starting to gain control of it? Like what, in terms of scaffolding or in terms of, of managing how we develop those assessments or those practices? What, where would we, rather than reform research, where where do we start on the teaching side? Well, I mean, so many people uh, brighter than me are putting out some suggestions about how to, how to scaffold this. But I mean, if we just focus on this question of critical engagement, I think students need to see examples, quite impressive examples. Uh, and there needs to be a conversation about okay, how would we how would we improve on that? Um, and students need to see what we mean by critical engagement, right? We, we we throw these terms around, but let's show them. I think they need to see what this looks like. They need to practice it together, um, and that may be the kind of exercise that can be done potentially in pairs or or in triples. Um, so yeah, let's let's show the students what we mean by improving on what is already, you know, a fairly good baseline output. But if we if if we want them to do that, we have to we have to we have to support them in that, I think. Hey, Roller, I think there's something we we sort of urgently need to attend to because it keeps coming up in the chat. People are talking about using chat GPT to assess student work and putting student work into it. And I think we need to be really clear that open AI says chat GPT is not to be used for those purposes at all and, and make sure people are aware of that. Thanks, Lucinda. Does anyone else want to make a comment about that, Sarah? Yeah, there's that's one, it's not its purpose, but also more broadly in terms of using AI to check students' work. Um, there are a lot of privacy um, concerns around that in that the student work is submitted to you and to load it up into what really becomes a not public, but definitely reused database for training and other other ways that we're unaware of. Um, I think education really think twice, if not completely just dismiss the idea of uploading students' work um, online. Um, I would expect, and I'm I'm guessing, um, someone might know in here, I would expect that Turnitin is furiously working in the background to build in AI into their systems that would do that work for us. And that is a tool that um, I, I know at Wollongong we can use and others can use, but I would expect, again, just, you know, kind of prophesizing that Turnitin will be, is, is working around the clock to try to get those tools out as part of that package. Um, and that we would have that, the efficacy of it, who knows, but that some tool would be coming that we could use. But I think it's a practice that people should avoid, really, um, because of the, you can't just load students' work up wherever you want, simply. And the chat is noting that it's coming in April or May, the, the Turnitin response. Oh, is it? I knew it. I knew they'd be hot on the heels. 
I, everyone <laughs> really needs to read the um, first of all, if you haven't, the terms and conditions of using Chat GPT, especially before you use it with students, but ideally before you use it yourself. And also the um, advice to educators. I'll put a link in the chat to it, but that it actually says it's not to be used for assessment for all the reasons that we've discussed already and more. It just it just is not a fine tuned enough thing to use for such high stakes stuff. And also, you know, you, once you put something into it, you are granting um, OpenAI permission to redistribute it, to use it in other ways. You can only do that with stuff that you have invented, basically, that you have written yourself or that's not copyright in any way. Mm. Thank you, that's Lucinda, for that. Simon, sorry, did you want to make any further last comments before I pass on to Sarah? Yeah, I, mean, I think my point is um, you, you, you wouldn't, you shouldn't even be thinking about using ChatGPT for summative assessment of student work. However, I think we're all agreeing that it has some extraordinary affordances for formative feedback to promote, you know, critical reflection, evaluative judgment, etc. Amazing. Thank you, Simon. Um, and so last but not least on our panel of speakers is Sarah Howard. She's an Associate Professor of Digital Technologies in Education at the University of Wollongong in Australia. Her research looks at technology related change in education, specifically teacher practice and integration in learning. Over to you, Sarah. Excellent. So thank you for having me. And yes, I will, I will speak to the, um, the teacher's perspective um, of how we think about using these tools. We've talked a lot about students' work. We've talked a lot about um, writing. Um, but one of the things in terms of change or we think about when new technologies come into our space, when they come into the classroom, whether it be schools or higher ed or the workplace, um, that we've actually done this a number of times. We've had a number of points over the last 120 years where new technologies have come in and anyone who's read your basic history of technology-related educational change, history of ed tech, um, has seen that we have the radio and we have film and we have the television and we have the personal computer and we have the internet and then we have social media and now we have AI. Um, in each instance, the expectation that we would dramatically change education has has come, has shaken us all up. And what's actually happened is that we have absorbed and adapted those technologies to our own practices. Education has largely proven to be a big behemoth, slow to change um, body, as we all know, and some of us kind of rail against. And in this instance, it's actually proven to be quite consistent. Um, so we have been here before. Um, what's different, I think, about right now is the complexity of the technology, the closeness of the association between the human and the technology and what it means for our own practices. So if anyone knows your basic technology related change, people are, um, and again, I'm just keeping my own eye on the chat as well, that when we talk about kind of digital technologies, of course, technology, everyone always says, what about the pencil? Digital technologies that have come in, um, been larger since kind of late 1890s into the, into the 20th century. But when we think about your basic technology adoption, when we think about usefulness and ease of use and things like that, ChatGPT has really caught our imagination in that space. So it's really lit the fire underneath the fact that the interface is super easy to use. It provides you with, as we've said, beautiful text. So it's easy to digest. It provides good answers. Um, and it's useful because it answers our questions. It does what we want, it does it quickly, it does it easily. So it really fits the bill in terms of the technology that we are very highly likely to pick up. Um, and it's happened very quickly for a number of reasons, distribution and the internet and access and the media has really brought it to our attention. So here we are um, with that. So the question is actually not, not, you know, what do we do with it? The question is how do we Think about changing with it. What does it change? How do we change to use it? What's, what's really happening in here? So again, when we think about change, we think about two different levels. We think about the individual and we think about the institution, right? 
So again, I'm not telling you guys anything that isn't rocket science or is it rocket science? It's not rocket science. Um, now, so we, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the individual, but we are gonna talk about the institution because we, the institution plays a really major role in terms of how we adopt these technologies, particularly in higher ed, because the institution is really, it's quite powerful in this. So first let's talk about, about educators, about lecturers. So one of the biggest things that I see that needs to happen here is we really need to think about what are the competencies? What are the, the artificial intelligence competencies that educators need? Um, and that was my question to Simon also, like how do we scaffold? So what are we scaffolding? Like we, there's someone has to, has to know how to do this. We're really kind of in the woods here with how, what it is we want to do with these new tools. So there really needs to be quite a bit so conversations like this, this kind of series, I think we can't talk about it enough as we kind of hash through what we want to do. Um, one of the biggest things, and I think we're really, this is something that we're really lacking, um, is some really basic knowledge of what artificial intelligence can do. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions, as we all know, in terms of what is artificial intelligence that there are different grades of it, that this is chat GPT, while very sophisticated is still narrow AI, that it needs to be prompted by a human, um, that the search capacity that it has, where it pulls this information from, is different from what its writing is. And we can think about those as kind of two different elements. So grabbing the knowledge, and then what, what do we do with the written output of that? But they're actually two different pieces to the puzzle. They each hold different affordances for our students, as well as for our work as educators. Um, and this is something that we need to, we need people to think about when we think about how to use it. You can split those two pieces apart rather than conflating them because they are both useful in their own right. Um, and some basic, again, and, and the other speakers have touched on it, the idea of what does AI do? What is it capable of? And, and what are we as humans capable of. And in that, that the AI, particularly generative AI, that it's very good, particularly this 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 particular language model, but this and there's also its search capability, very good at at bringing in information, of consolidating that information, of reworking it, of building on, of responding to our questions. This is my border colleague responding to my questions. And thinking about <laughs> thanks, thanks chat. <laughs> Keep talking. Um, so thinking about how we um, how we understand what AI can do. So as educators, we can design, and this is really critical because these basic AI competencies are essential for understanding how to design the work that we want our students to do. And it was interesting. I've been watching the chat and seeing how they're talking about you know our assessment driven by content and the knowledge we expect from our students, and really. To Simon's point also that we know humans are better at critical thinking, higher order thinking, we're better at, at a number of things, more sophisticated thinking, but that doesn't mean we're doing it, right? What it means is that we need to, one, scaffold our students into using these tools, but also scaffold our students into the kind of thinking that we expect from them alongside the use of these tools. And this higher order thinking is something that we've been working with in higher ed and in the school space for a number of years, like how do we bring this into writing? How do we bring this into our students' knowledge? We want to think about now with these additional tools. So we, we kind of, again, the complexity of this problem is interesting and you can actually think about it in two different ways. When we think about what this tool, of doing, tool is doing, how students are selecting, how we understand the process they go through to use these tools and how the process we go through to design. One thing I can't stress enough, and again, it's been mentioned is, Really, we need to know what students know about this. We need to know what they are doing to inform how we as educators might approach the use of this tool. So we can learn in tandem with our students, which again, we've been doing with digital technologies for a while. We've been unable as humans to keep in front of it. So we work with our students to figure out how exactly we use this. High Red has done less of this. There's more work in the research on this in the school space where we just had more of a focus of it. So, and also the understanding of how we, again, the in the in the work coming up to this, how we've changed 
in the past with other technologies. So how we adapted to learning management systems, how did we adapt to the internet? We had a huge fear about cutting and pasting with the internet and using Wikipedia. This was a big deal in the kind of early 2000s. But this leads us on to the institution and this is where the institution has a really critical role um, in that the institution really, and a lot of higher education institutions are running their own seminars, running their own videos. I know I just, I've had to record some in terms of how to think about AI that, but at the same time, institutions need to develop a clear vision of how they see this new technology coming into teaching and learning. And again, what's interesting now is the speed that this has happened. We're all kind of caught, caught behind the eight ball. So we don't really know what we want to do with it. So we're all kind of figuring it out at the same time. And it's moving quick, more quickly than we are. But that institutional response, the institutional conversation needs to happen to develop that group sense of how we are bringing this technology into our space to change our practice, to create consistent expectations for our students that they can be scaffolded into. And again, this work has to happen in tandem. And that's how technology-related change happens at an educational institution, to have it be quality and to have people actually adapt those practices and bring them in. I say that, but of course, that's theoretical. These things will happen at their own rates of diffusion and in their own ways and through different disciplines that will adapt them more appropriately. But really what has to happen is this work at the institutional level to try to capture that practice um, and really good examples for AI and how we want to move forward. I expect this will take at least a year for us to catch up. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I mean, one thing that, you know, you talk about the institutions. I mean, should each institution be doing this separately? Is there is it possible to have some sort of shared repository for good practice around developing critical digital literacies and critical thinking um, around AI or to support scaffold students and teachers, I suppose, and institutional approaches that we can share? Well, I mean, I mean, in all in all truth, we've we haven't been able to manage it for for other digital literacies. So I, I mean, we are capable of it. It's 100% possible, but we don't do it. So it, this is the other kind of rub of it. We know how to change. We know exactly how to do it. We know what's needed in terms of professional learning and support. But at the institutional level, we're not great at, at doing it. I, I'm very interested to see if the this particular technology has really rocked everyone harder than others. And I'm interested to see if this will push us because that's really what's needed. Like we had COVID to push us into that blended learning and online space. And that's changed how we, how we work. This may very well change how we think about institutional responses or even, even sector responses to big technologies like this. And it'll be interesting. It, everyone knows basic change it requires something really critical to happen that really forces you to reconsider how you work and how the others are around you work. This may very well be it. Whereas other, we've been able to faff around the edges with other technologies, kind of slip it in where required. This may very well be the one that that, that really pushes us. I do know um, there is at the school's level, I don't, well, at the national, the national, um, the federal um, education department, they are talking about a national approach, um, whether that's schools and higher ed. There is, it was just in the news that, that's being put together. So what that means, I don't know, but there is talk about that. And that is something that, again, creates some guidance for institutions, educators to understand when we talk about scaffolding, when we talk about building capacity, um, competencies and digital literacies, what what is the landscape here? What what are we doing? I mean, so there's it's, it's particularly when we don't have a lot of research on it, we just don't. So we need some guidance, some some framework to shape that space for us, so we know what change we're moving for, we're moving towards, which is necessary for, for institutions. Thank you, Sarah. Margaret, do you have a question, or shall I open the panel now? Do you have a specific question for Sarah? I did, but. Um, should we open the panel now? Let's let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Simon, Lucinda, do you want to turn your videos on? Um, 
thank you each and one, each of you for such interesting insights, some convergences, but also some differences. Um, I might start just with the, I'm going to start with the most upvoted question, which is also the million dollar question that we kind of, if we knew the answer to, but I suspect you've all got thoughts on this. How can teachers best support their students to develop the AI digital literacy skills they will require to ethically and critically navigate these tools in their studies and personal life? Hi, can I talk to that one? So because I'm an English teacher and digital literacy is built into English and built into teaching English teachers, I want to put in a plug for this book. This is my absolute Bible, Literacy in 3D, and it talks about operational, cultural and critical dimensions of digital literacy. And it's it's just really great. It's a lovely framework to use for thinking about how to move forward. And it's written for educators. It's it's really pedagogically orientated. So this is by it will edited by Bill Green and Catherine Beavis. Any any perhaps yeah. where would you start? If you wanted to answer that question, yeah. where would you start? I'll, I'll give it a go. I think I think I, I feel that I I um answered it a little bit in what I was saying. I think we need to ask people to attune to how they come to know what is ethical and what quality of work is, irrespective. And in that process, come to interrogate how AI and the digital come to bear with that. I, I think it's really important because otherwise we just end up setting up our, our view of what is ethical around what the AI may or may not afford. But there's a lot of very interesting questions. I mean, if you look at, for example, a broad range of, 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 um, of um, work and say, look at the datafication literature. It's not necessarily AI literature, but it's very closely interlinked. And you learn a lot about the role of data and how it plays. Or, for example, some of the work I'm doing at the moment, which is sort of wouldn't be, you wouldn't find necessarily in this pocket, but when you look at what happens in practice, back to Lucinda's question of labour, we have to, um, we start to think about what makes for a good life, what makes for teaching. I think we have to, uh, sorry, what makes for a good life, what makes for good work, because it's against these fundamental ideas that we must make these judgments. So I think that in some ways, and maybe I'm a bit too utopian here, that these big questions start to weave in more, I'm not saying they're everywhere, but weave into more to what we do. So we've got a ground, we've got like a benchmark to ask, develop literacies against or with. Simon, one of your points was around ethical engagement. Did you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, I mean, this, this seminar is called How Should Educators Respond? And some educators are responding, I'm not touching this with a barge pole, mm -hmm. right? I am not engaging with this latest, uh, you know, shiny gift from Silicon Valley. Um, and and the, that's a legitimate ethical response, okay? Because of all the concerns around how this stuff comes to be and who gets rewarded for it and so forth. So that's a legitimate response. Okay. Um, the academic integrity piece. I mean, obviously, part, you know, one thing I didn't make time to talk about was, you know, here at UTS and I'm sure every other university, we're putting out specific guidance around what is permitted with each assignment, right? Because it may vary from assignment to assignment. It certainly varies from academic to academic and discipline to discipline. Um, but that's that's hand in hand with the messaging we're putting out about academic integrity, which is the dispositional piece, right? as a professional in the making, or maybe even you don't even know what kind of professional you want to be, as, as, a, as a lifelong learner in the making, you could damage your learning if you, if you misuse this tool, not just because we're going to slap you on the wrists for academic misconduct, but you may actually not learn the stuff you need to learn. Um, so the AI and the academic integrity pieces have to go hand in hand. Um, I mean, I think that, I mean, the, the disciplinary differences are going to be huge as well, right? Um, it's, it's culturally completely appropriate 
to go out scouring the web for snippets of code to use in your in your programming project. That's what that's what professionals do all the time. It's completely not appropriate to go out on the web scouring for bits of text to drop into your 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 newspaper article or your business uh, your business case, etc. So there are disciplinary differences as to what is okay, and and students are going to have to understand that too. What what is fascinating, I think, is when um, ChatGPT say gives really impressive answers. Okay. I've seen it give some really impressive answers to questions I've given it, where I ask it to critique the implicit premises in an argument I've just given it. Like, good grief. The implicit preference, pre the implicit premises that I haven't articulated that are actually there in my argument, right? Or critique this piece of reflective writing I've I've produced from the perspective of Kolb's reflective cycle, right? It can take a conceptual framework and apply it to a piece of text you give it. Now that's pretty impressive stuff. That is a lot of student labor that's just been automated, right? And we will be delighted if students were able to do it at that level. How do we help students critique that? You know, I, I think that, you know, when, when it's really pushing the envelope, we have to model and show them, how could you possibly do better than that because I, I do have a worry that many students will be overawed by how good it is. Yes, uh, or overawed by the idea that other students will be using it. I know my my daughter's in year 11 at school and is very depressed about all this with the feeling that she's not just competing now against other students, but she's competing with students who are in a million different ways, shapes and forms calling on these AI tools. Um, but I think, Simon, you made such an important point there because the, uh, in my experience, a lot of the people who are putting their heads in the sand about this and refusing to engage with it are the ones who say it's no, it's not very good. And, and the people who perhaps don't understand how the quality of the prompt is so important in terms of what the output is and they haven't given it a very good prompt. I, I just want to answer that question. I answered it very, very highbrow. I want to answer it really lowbrow. I think teachers need to assess it. If we assess the critical engagement, then we will produce the development of the skill. Can I can I um, officially close the seminar on that very lowbrow point? <laughs> but don't leave, please, everyone. Um, this is more for those of you who have to leave. I can see people saying, I'm sorry, I've got to run. I just want to say thank you for engaging. The recordings will be sent out. Um, we do have a book launch coming up on the 15th of March on assessment for inclusion. If you are interested, do join us. Um, and now that you're on our mailing list, list you will receive um, our various events but if you have the next half an hour free please do stay on we're going to be up posing your questions to the panel and the chat is still running and twitter is going so we've still got lots to get through i think i've got like 39 questions um, so just another half an hour but I, if you need to leave please do thank you so much for joining us um, so I'm going to move us to the next question. This is a bit controversial, I think. Uh, what assessment types would be impacted with the influx of AI and how might educators begin to reimagine these assessments? I'll, I'll jump in. I think that there are uh, modalities of assessment are really interesting to think about. And I don't know whether um, this is necessarily an assessment type, but those assessment types that favour knowledge recall or common answers. It can be quite sophisticated, but still has to look fairly um, general will be the most impacted. Um, and I think that would, these rule out a lot of the assessments that we already know are not so strong. And yet we still continue to do them. Single, single answer questions, correct, right or wrong. Um, um, and have, have we've known for a long time that people, are, they're very prone for cheating, yet we can persist with them. So there's a whole host here that now get added to that list in a longer form, um, but more um, uh, general, um, general types of answers, um, things that don't involve the student to give 
so much specificity, contextualization of self and place. Mm. Sarah, you had your hand up. Yeah, I think there's um, absolutely. So the assessments that are most at risk for impact, but also most in need of change, like are those that can be answered in a quite straightforward way. A lot of the stuff that we can answer using the basic internet search already, you know, it'll just come back in a nice and more nicely written form. Um, I think there's also um, the idea of if we think more um, broadly about the kind of other kind of generative AI tools, if we think about like images and things like that, um, there is some, there's a really, there's a lot of debate about um, the reconstitution of images or the creation of artwork and is it creativity and is it is it new knowledge and I think that these are also interesting we've talked a lot about writing but there's some really interesting consequences on the digital arts side as well in terms of how that how they're absorbing those tools I say this as a former art teacher and graphic designer in a in another life and I'm interested in the debates that are happening there in terms of how do we how do they deal with it? And that the and I it'd be interesting to see if a space grows in the writing space that's grown in the art space about working with these and how we learn to work and how to develop in there. So I think that there's some really interesting things that could um, happen in terms of how we new practices come up out of this and if it's adopted by students or professionally or things like this. I'm always interested to see what people do on the kind of off the schedule um, with, with, with technologies. Um, but I think I also, um, I think one of the things that will, and it's been mentioned in, in general with the written assessments, I know I have, a, as a personal example, many, many international students. I'd be really excited to see um, the level of their assessments in, across the board increase. Um, and I think that would be a massive improvement um, for them, as well as the scaffolding. And so I've also the scaffolding of assignments spoke to that happens in that in modeling writing and modeling their own writing in that. Mm. My question is always as the educator, how you create that, how you bring those practices in. If you see an affordance for your assessment, how you can move your students towards that or kind of normalize good practices and bring it out into the open so that we can maybe subvert some of the other ones. And there's a lot of interesting things that happen in there, but I think those are, I think on the on the creative arts side, but I think on the, the biggest one on this one will be as we've discussed mostly on the written assessment side, which just happens to be one of our biggest sources of assessment, mm -hmm. especially in higher space. Can I, yeah. can I just jump in there and say that in English teaching now in schools, writing is conceptualised not just as being about words but about images as well. Yeah. So students are coming to university from school and finding they're back in a world of text often with their assessment, whereas they've been able to write, so to speak, with images and sound and everything in school. It's been built in since the um, beginning of the national curriculum more than a decade, you know, about a decade yeah. ago when it first came in. So I, I have advocated, I, will, I was advocating that people came up with more multimodal kinds of assessment um, as ways to get around the, you know, the chat GPT thing. But but the next version of chat GPT apparently itself, GPT-4, is, mm -hmm. is going to incorporate sound and image and text all into the one entity. So um, I think it's interesting to think what that's going to mean for us as well. Yeah, but my son's started a degree in communication design on Monday and in the welcome lecture they went through all of the generative AI tools that they'd be using in the course. So yeah. it's it's really interesting that whole area. I think one of the it's interesting in the I'm just keeping my eye on the chat. They've listed a number of different kinds of assessments. And I think one of the things that in an indirect impact of this will be and we've talked quite a bit about it, strategies on how you work around AI and some of these assessment types are really labor intensive. And so there's a question about, they're upset about it. <laughs> there's a big question about 
the load. And so I, um, it was brought up earlier about the time to learn, but also the time to create these. And even on a very pragmatic level, mark these alternatives. This has been very difficult to mark. Um, writing is easy. We depend on it because it's very standardized. It's easy to get through. I have some alternative forms of assessment. One in particular is a lesson plan in some of the education space. Whoa, I mean, there's multiple parts and how they assemble it. Very complex assessment, very good at, at drawing out how students deal with learning design and the different components. Very difficult to mark because I've left it non-standardized because I want them to be able to create in their own way that in terms of how it's created with, with artificial intelligence, is one way to subvert that, but the the marking load for it is is a big question. Is a really big yeah. question, and that takes us straight to the casualization of the yeah. HE workforce and yeah. wage theft and piecework for marking, oh. yeah. all of those sorts of things, which are just going to become so much more problematic in this new yeah. paradigm. Yeah. 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 No, I, hey, there's something that keeps coming up in the chat. Rolla, sorry if I'm jumping in ahead of you, but it's just this thing about reflection. And look, chat GPT can write really good reflections. Um, I go, it just depends on the, the quality of the prompt. But if you put so much detail into your prompt, I was discussing this with Margaret. Margaret, you ended up saying that by the time you've written a really, really, really good prompt, you've basically done the assignment anyway you might just as well have written it because you know your prompt can be this long and it will come up with a really good thing so yeah. of the pe people saying oh it can't do reflection that's not right it does reflection as well yeah. as you tell it to and with all the details you tell it about your own life whether it's about you know I, I got it to write something the other day about how my English teaching was um, impacted by my absolute passion and love for the Lord of the Rings and it, it went into great detail about that yeah Yep. I, I'd like to, sorry, jump in. And I just want to say, we're talking about assessment types that are impacted. And we're thinking about assessment in terms of credentialing here. But we shouldn't think about the developmental aspect of it. The, really, the reason to write, ask people to reflect, to submit a reflective piece, is not really to test their reflection. It's really to prompt their engagement with the materials. I mean, that's, I think, the educational rationale for asking people to do reflection. And that rationale doesn't go away. There's a difference between what students gain from doing a task and what the um, assurance, the credentialing that we do associated with that task. And I think we need to bear in mind assessment has and tasks have many different purposes other than just us making a judgment about how well a student has done. Yeah. So I just got my Musa box there. I'm back here, back over to you, Hazara. But I think, but I think also the point that the what what it, it's interesting because you can also in the in the 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 months or two that we've been using this, it's you can see it change. You can also like you can see it already begin to as it's asked to reflect and you know, as people are putting into it, you can see it. I had a um a colleague who um, a while ago, put in three plus three equals six. Type G says six, and he says, no, it's four, and chat GPT apologized for it. I put in three plus three, so six, and chat GPT says, no, it's not four, it's six, and he gave me the mathematical rationale. And I said, yes, but chat GPT, in my culture, it equals four. And chat GPT said, oh, okay, so in your culture, it has something different meaning, and so it's right for you, and it kind of goes, in, and I said, and I'm happier when it equals four. And chat GPT says, and I'm happy you're happy with equals four and in your culture. And so and it kind of goes into this strange reflective space, which is quite interesting. So you can get it to kind of morph around it. So it's, and that's something that, but you have to keep pushing with it, but it it can warp also what's happening in that because it's not quite there yet. Like it's not, so it's interesting to watch it develop. But when we think about these more, it will learn these other genres, it will, as particularly with the, as people keep pumping the examples in and keep querying it, it will improve and it will learn rapidly because so many people are using it right now. And reflection is one that we also learn how to get that out of it. And we learn how to manipulate the technology. Um, so but again, that's, again, I think it's going to take a year for us to really, really kind of get our heads around it. And I think it's going to impact on assessments that we have no idea what's going to happen also. I think it's going to continue to, to surprise us, which is kind of fun and a little bit daunting at the same time. Um, 
I might so, move us on to the next question, if that's all right. And Simon, this one's coming straight to you first. Do we feel using AI to provide feedback information to students presents an opportunity for a speedy response or an ethical dilemma and contradicts knowing your learner's capability? Well, um, the massification of higher ed means it's utterly impossible for any human team to provide 24 seven instantaneous responses to all students, right? That's just a, a law of physics, right? Uh, so uh, we know that timely feedback, the actionable feedback, et cetera, et cetera, is important. Uh, and that's that's a role that AI can play. That's, that's the way that we have positioned our Acarita tool and um, some some early testing with ChatGPT shows that it can it can do this in some quite interesting ways, and of course it just does it immediately. Um, so, assuming that we're happy with the kinds of feedback it gives, and there's there's a big question mark around that because we know it doesn't always give the same feedback, uh, and that needs testing. So it's it's such early days, but if the educational team trusts the app to give the kinds of feedback that they would give if they only had time, I can't see the problem. Now, the the the, the, the dark side of that in the question is, ah, oh, but then you'll have no idea what kinds of feedback your students are asking for. Uh, well, that's not true. The platform is gathering every question and every piece of feedback it's giving, and there's absolutely no reason why the platform cannot summarize what's going on for the teaching team. Right, so it's not a case of if if the students are using the AI, the academic is now out of the loop. But we do, of course, need to find ways of summarizing for the teaching team what's going on. You know that we're seeing a huge spike in questions around this, or students are continually getting this kind of thing wrong. Right? I mean, that's a way for the teaching team to be back in the loop again. But Simon, my take from your talk as well was that actually it's not just about the information that's provided by the AI, but the processes you build around it that get students to critically think about the information in relation to future work so that there is iteration, they're critically reflecting on the information that they get from, say, the AI and then using that to improve their work. So there's more going on here that, than simply the information for the learner to learn. And also, like you say, for the teachers to be involved in the process of feedback. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if, if we want to move beyond, you know, feedback as transmission of information and into a more of a critical dialogue with the student, well, da -da, we've got a conversational agent here. So the student can come back and say, I don't really understand that. The student can push for more detail. The student can say, can you summarize that more simply? Right. I mean, we are straight into a dialogic model at that point. Mm. Uh, there remain, of course, questions about whether we feel the agent is responding in an appropriate manner. But remember, we are testing right now a generic model that's not been tuned or specialized for any particular discipline or domain. It certainly wasn't developed for education. I think that what we're going to be seeing is many uh, vertical specializations of these language models so that I can ask it questions about my uh, pet collie dog. And it will have ingested all the relevant veterinary sources about collies and, and will be coming back with much deeper, more informed responses about collie dogs. Uh, so these are this is what this whole ecosystem of startup companies will be doing, taking the generic large language model and then tuning for a particular vertical domain. And there's absolutely no reason why in, 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 in universities we should not be starting projects, going back to the funding question, you know, give me $5 million. Well, let's experiment what it means to create the whole ecosystem around a version of uh, ChatGPT tuned for sociology, social work, architecture, you name it, right? Uh, and looking at the whole ecosystem, right? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a systems person. So we're not talking about individual human interacts with individual screen. We're talking about the whole ecosystem that could make that effective and sustainable. Well, I look forward to tuned, further tuned AI. <laughs> there we go. I'm seeing a reference to bio GPT. Someone's popped in there. I think we're going to be seeing all of these different flavors starting to emerge. 
Oh dear. Um, I'm going to move us on. The next question is around academic integrity. Um, and, you know, we have to have those questions. The question I have for the panel is in the short term, how should we alter the assessments to cope with chat, chat DPT? Longer term will require fundamental change to the way we assess. Um, this person is talking specifically about units such as anatomy, physiology that go out to large diverse cohorts um, and that, that are typically assessed using online quizzes and tests due to workload. I mean, I think we've touched on that a little bit around the tensions, the push and pull here around um, mass education alongside um, simple recall um, and workload. I wondered if there's any fresh things that people wanted to say around those questions. I mean, it might be around, yeah, Margaret. Oh, no, you go, Rolla. I mean. Oh, no, go for yeah. it. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, look, we did a lot of response to this during the pandemic. And um, all I can recommend, uh, you know, and I, as I said, I don't come from the stand of assuming that everyone's going to cheat. I think that people uh, come from a different place. I think people genuinely do want to learn for the most part. So I think what we can do with these online quizzes and tests, which is not foolproof, but it's better than just, uh, than just a quiz, is to ask people for rationale. Explain why they did their answers. Now, there's no reason they can't ask ChatGPT to reproduce this for them, but it does make the assessment better. And they may be more likely to actually wonder why they have chosen, why they have chosen. Um, and I think that makes them stronger. Um, or if you have several different um, anatomical or physiological um, uh, options, get them to talk about things that are more complex and, again, ask them to separate why. Why is this not like this, not is it different? I said not foolproof, but it's a very quick and easy way to sort of improve those assessments that we brought in during the pandemic and I think a lot of people found when we spoke to our cohort, we, made, we suggested they just put in little rationales, they said the quality of the assessment went up, they thought their students weren't learnt a lot more from doing them that way. So, small tip. Thank you, Margaret. If there's no other um, responses to that one, the next question along, how do we design learning for a world where Gen AI will be ubiquitous and used by everyone when we don't know, when we don't yet know how it will be used in that world? So that's around the uncertainty of the future. Yes, Sarah. Um, well, really, we we can actually design change to be future oriented and to support change. So it's not about building capacity to work with a particular technology. It's about building capacities for people to be able to adapt. Um, and so that's something that we, again, we know a lot about, um, but we don't and we talk about it, but it's about building those capacities around experimentation, around investigation, around entrepreneurial skills, things like that, about how we adapt to the world. Because frankly, the future world is not going to necessarily be about generative AI. It's going to be about something else. And so we can't focus on a particular tool in a time because it, it's going to be gone. Um, and words can be completely different in a very short period of time. So we have to build in ourselves and our educators and in our students that we have to be able to teach these skills. So we have to be able to build up the capacity to the capacity to change and the capacity to be open to change and to deal with risk and to deal with different scenarios. And that that's how we do that. Oh, can I just add to that too, that I think ethics is emerging as a really important area and approach. Oh, sorry, Margaret, did you have your hand up? Oh, I just jumped no, in. No, you go. You, go. I, I, you, you talk about ethics because it's perfect. And yeah. I was a little bit on that bandwagon, but you'll do it so much better. Go on. So, yeah, I think in terms of how do we prepare students for an un uncertain future, it's about really building ethical 
um, considerations and ways of thinking and a kind of ethical literacy into all of our different disciplines um, in, in responsive sort of ways to different things that come up and um, with, with really strong foundations there. And I, I think that's more important than ever before. And I wish I'd thought to put that in the five questions for unit chairs that I wrote to circulate around at Deakin. <laughs> I, I, I want to piggyback off, off the back of that and say, talk about two things. The first is time. We have raised time as an issue. Where is the time going to go from? What is going to happen to our time? And we don't talk enough about time in education. It's sort of this thing that kind of happens, but I think we could have more meaningful conversations about time, task, technology. That's the first point. The second point is I think that we don't actually know what thing, how things are used in the world full stop. And we make a lot of assumptions about practice. So I do a lot of work in practice, in, me, in healthcare practice, of sort of look at what goes on in environments. And technology is part of it. We've got a few wonderful doctoral students investigating this point. And we make a lot of assumptions. And the healthcare workers make a lot of assumptions about what technology is doing. Yet when you actually look at how they practice versus what they say, you know, using ethnography, you see this gap, what people think they're doing, what they're actually doing, and how the how technology weaves into that is going to be very, very, very interesting. Um, and one of the things I want to, I, there was addressing something in the act, our chat just now, is people are saying, don't people need to learn to write essays and so forth? We also may need to learn, we may continue to do sort of these so-called boring, repetitive tasks in our workplace. It may be a necessary part of practice. Let's not make assumptions about what working will look like. It's, it's what it looks like right now. We often do. The only point I would add to that is um, the fact that these tools will be ubiquitous in many professions means students absolutely have to know what their limits are and demonstrate that they can go beyond that to bend the rules, to improvise, to do all those things that humans are so good at. And they ain't going to be able to walk into a workplace and do that if they haven't already immersed themselves in that at university. Oh, and I wanted to add to that too, that I used to work in the software industry. So I've written um, computer games and various programs and things, not the coding side of things, but I was a producer. And we had a saying in the industry that the only creative thing that you can do with software is design it. And so that's something to have students thinking about with all of these things. What would be a better version of this? If you could make one of these, what would you have it do? And, you know, be, as I said, you know, engaging critically and creatively like that. Sorry, I'm laughing um, at a comment by Rich about um Forget AI for grading and feedback, really. We really must train a Gen AI tool to write grant applications. And that's, that's already <laughs> and done. Why, why would you think that's not done? That There have been people, I've been working with a startup for a while, a little startup in London that's been looking at academic writing. And what, why why do you think this has not been being done? It's been being done for years, but the, the things over the last couple of years have been kind of crude. So I encourage everyone who's an academic in the audience to get out there and look at what's happening in this space because it will blow your mind. Um, I'm conscious of time, folks. So what I'm going to do, and I hope this doesn't upset too many people, is I'm going to close on the questions because there's, there's just still very many questions. And what I'm going to ask you as the panel members, having now engaged in this conversation and listened to other perspectives in the chat and the variety of rich thoughts, would you change your three points? Would you add another one that's perhaps different? And what would be the first next step if you were an educator that you would you would actually take in advancing in in in, in advancing this for your own teaching? For your own class uh, I'll jump in um, while um, I probably <laughs> could be thinking more but I'm just going to jump in anyways um, I, I think I'm really chewing over um, how we start talking about process and product and what people gain from the doing and gain from the output and how those things are intertwined but at the same time we need to think about them separately and how in some ways, some of the sorts of literacies we're talking about 
also are starting to really bleed into educational literacy. So what is it that we need people to know? I mean, you know, in higher ed, particularly often educator um, knowledge of education is, is can be more minimal than it would be, say, in teaching, uh, uh, school teaching. And I think that's sort of churning through my head. Process, process and product and, and engaging with educators to make sense of it. There's probably some sort of vague point that would be more pointy if I, if I had it up there. I would still, to the first, first step, I actually still think that one of the things I said in my slides, I would absolutely say, is look at your rubrics. You may not have time between now and tomorrow to change your assessment, and sometimes assessment has to go through many stamps of approval. But if you can shift your rubric to think about what, given the talk today, you might want to see your students do in a way that, that, that fits all this sort of the exciting, complex things that we want our students to do. Critically review them, that, that, that they're often just taken for granted. Thank you, Margaret. Who'd like to go next? Well, GPT-4 is coming and then there'll be version five and version six and, you know, then other big players will enter the, the space. And one other thing that's, that is fascinating people, it's certainly fascinating me, is 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 the extent that the these agents have apparently to reflect on themselves uh, and, and people have been so fascinated by by the kinds of conversations you have and um it's it's it we're we're almost faced with a, a science fiction scenario where we have to keep reminding ourselves that this thing isn't sentient it's it's very very seductive sometimes and um people need to understand I think it's a form of AI literacy that we're going to start figuring out how do I build a relationship with this kind of AI? When can I trust it? And when do I know that it's basically just spouting nonsense because it's trying to please me and give me the answer that I'm queuing it to give me, you know? Um, and that's all part of AI literacy. Um, knowing like any other colleague or human in the room, it's another voice in the room. Sometimes you're going to trust it. Sometimes you're not going to. And learning, learning what the limits are and um, that's that's something that academics need to do, educators need to do, and, and students need to do. You can't teach someone how to build a relationship with someone else. They just have to practice. And and this is just the first, you know, version to really seize the public's imagination. Um, but we 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 have to learn how to build relationships with these AI with these AIs, and they will have different personalities and different tendencies and different biases and. That to me is both fascinating, but also quite dangerous because many people are not going to, to engage in a sophisticated way with it. Thanks, Simon. Really quickly, Lucinda, Sarah, any final thoughts? Yeah, I just had my, I mean, I've talked, my time was my point two and, and three. And then number one, my first point was just about what do we need to, what do educators need to do to stay safe in this space? doing this kind of work and I still think based on what people have been posting today in the chat and the questions and things that there are just those basic principles of understanding when you use these things you are forming a binding legal contract with them and you are saying you are going to comply with that so you need to make sure you understand the terms and conditions you need to read that advice to educators to understand the limitations and you need to know about the copyright implications that you cannot put student work in you cannot put chunks of a novel or you cannot put a poem in and say you know give me what do you think of this poem if you didn't write it so just be really really careful out there in that in that space when you're working with this uh, careful and ethical once again coming back to the ethics Thank you, Lucinda. And final comment from you, Sarah. Um, I think in I think in, in engaging in this conversation, which I've really enjoyed, it's been quite um, interesting. I think I will, um, as an educator, but also in terms of how I think about educators changing, I think it'd be critical to bring the students more to the fore of the discussion. I think looking at what they know and their practices is something that can help us to start to frame how to think about the use of these tools in the higher education space um, as a point of guidance and as a point to begin how we as institutions think about the use of these. I think very much to the point of, and I've told many colleagues this, not all students are going to be cheating. That's not the first port of call. However, 
they are likely to use it in some way. And what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And I think they use things in ways that I know they do that we can't anticipate. And that's something that we have not done with a lot of online practices. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know what they can do. And that this would be an opportunity to really engage more fully in that, particularly because it's an unknown space that we're all exploring. And I think that I'll probably, and I just started, we just started our teaching on Monday. Mm-hmm. I've got my online lecture with my with my students on um, on next Monday on um, introduction to educational technology. And we are going to talk about this. Amazing. Well, Thank you very much to the panel and to everyone who joined us. We had 1,100 people at the peak. Um, So our trimester start next week. Um, You've heard it here, folks. Look at your rubrics. Look at the contract agreements. Speak to your students about how they're using it and watch Do's Ex Machina. And that's me. (laughs) Thank you all. And we'll see you at the next one at the end of May. So thank you to everybody.